So, um, yeah, please get uh, seated. There's a uh, there's a one-page uh, kind of a syllabus course information handout that's pass being passed around. So please grab one, and uh, in I think we'll be okay with the number of those uh, passing around. But in case you don't have one, obviously I I'll get one on on Friday and uh, also post one on the on the class website. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, well, uh, welcome to uh, ECE 4300. Uh, this is the uh, class on lasers and uh, optoelectronics. Uh, uh, so I am Dave Deep Jenna. I'll uh, be the primary instructor of this class. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Cliff Pollock, who has actually taught this course for uh, quite a few years before me, uh, will uh, actually uh, uh, be taking uh, I think roughly 15 of the, f uh, slightly more than 15 of the 40 lectures. So you will have to keep on your toes because we'll be switching between two instructors. But I think, I think, and I hope we'll offer each instructor will offer their best to you. You know, so and Professor Cliff Pollock is uh, sitting right here. Cliff, if yeah, I yeah. just uh, stand up, and he's uh, and those of you in EC know he's our department chair and director. So uh, and uh, I think you will be in really good hands with Cliff. So yeah, right. Yep, and Cliff, right. you. Know, I, uh, I've got to run to see a dean retreat right now, so I've got to run off before that stay. But I, I think I first taught this course 33 years ago. And remember my first, you weren't even born. None of you were born. <laughs> and I walked into class and I say, you know, we think lasers are going to be useful. Because there were scientific curiosity back then. Yeah. And proved to be very true. And, and the semiconductor laser was just this little joke back then. It barely ran at all. And now it just dominates the world. And so what I'm really excited about is Deputy is a semiconductor. He's going to add a lot of depth, which of course really needs in semiconductors. Because semiconductor lasers are critical. I'm more solid state lasers. So it's, uh, I think we're this can be fun. <coughs> I'm really looking forward to it. You got two very good talents here, and it should be a lot of fun and very stimulating. Thanks, Cliff. So I just want to put the hand off, but we'll yeah. you tell us how it's going. You know, yep. There'll be a little disconnect that sec. Just tell us, we'll fix it. All right. So I gotta run. All right, okay. thanks, Cliff. See you guys. Thank you. So, all right. Uh, uh, let me just uh, start off by saying that uh, I'll get the uh, logistics of the course uh, out first. Uh, so this is kind of described in the uh, handout I gave you. It has two pages, uh, uh, and uh, what uh, I want to say is you already uh, um, I already talked about me and uh, Professor Pollock. Uh, and uh, so there's a course website that uh, has been set up. Uh, this we are not using uh, Blackboard, but we are uh, just using our own uh, class website. And uh, this has been listed in the handout uh, I gave you. And uh, I have now the emails of all of you, uh, those who have registered for this class. And I'll create a mailing list and. I'll send you the link as well. So uh, please bookmark it, and uh, it has information. And m most importantly, it will have uh, you know any sort of handouts that m may be uh, uh, a required reading or or a course calendar, etc. Uh, but uh, also importantly, the assignments will be posted here, so you can uh, 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 download them as PDF files. Uh, the posting dates, the due dates. Uh, and uh, later on, after it's due, uh, we'll post the solutions as well on, on the website. So, uh, uh, that, so there's a, uh, so this should be a, a useful resource for you. Now, uh, moving on, the uh, so class hours. I think you know that's it's uh, three days a week, uh, 50 minutes each. Uh, uh, location is here, but. Uh, I don't want to say it, but there may be some changes. But I think we want to keep this room. It's about the right size, uh, just about the right size, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, in case there are any changes, obviously, I'll let you know. Uh, um, because in the beginning of semesters, things are always in a little bit of a flux as to which room uh, you're in. Uh, the prereq uh, for this class, oh, sorry, office hours, I'm going to decide based on uh, uh, all your course schedules this semester, uh, the, the least. Uh, uh, worst will be the uh, choice. So uh, either uh, uh, two hours in one of the days of the week or one hour for two days of the week. So I'll have office hours. For that. Good, so. uh, pre rec is a uh, uh, background in uh, EC3030, which is uh, our electromagnetic uh, electromagnetism, uh, Maxwell's equations, bit of ideas on uh, uh, 
uh, um, uh, you know, wave, waves and waveguides and such things. Uh, so, uh, or the permission of instructors. So, uh, let me first uh, just poll very quickly how many of you have not had, not had a course on electromagnetic theory or have not had a course on Maxwell's equations. Okay, so. I'm taking 30-30 right now. You're taking 30-30 right now, okay. So, uh, okay, so I. I, yeah. I didn't take 30-30, but I took some, like, some physics classes. Similar to yeah. uh, where you had Maxwell and waves and all, okay. And, and Victoria, you have also had something like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay, so I think, uh, um, and if you have any uh, further doubts, if you, in the beginning, we'll, y you see, you know, there's a freight train that came at you, just let me know, you know, because we obviously want to uh, uh, really do a good job in this course, uh, uh, understanding uh, lasers, and uh, as you know, lasers are, uh, you know, very, very much electromagnetic objects. I mean, they radiate light, and uh, that's an electromagnetic wave. So, uh, in case you see the going tough in some parts, please uh, uh, use office hours. Uh, both Cliff and I would be available, so uh, make use of this uh, resource. So. Okay, so uh, uh, moving along the logistics, uh, uh, the book. We are going to actually use a book for this course, uh, Laser Electronics, uh, by uh, Joseph uh, uh, Verdian, and this is a uh, um, uh, I think there are books in the uh, bookstore as well as we're putting some books in the library in case you don't want to uh, own one, you should. Uh, 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 but we'll actually be following this book, uh, um, um, maybe not slavishly, but reasonably, uh, you know, uh, according to the chapters and that sort of thing. So, so and uh, uh, we think uh, it's, it's a, uh, uh, it does a very good job uh, of uh, getting the fundamentals through in a palatable way because, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, we're going to follow this book, so please, uh, um, um, and then let me know if you are having a hard time getting a copy or uh, having access to a copy for this book. So, uh, the topics uh, are listed, essentially, uh, uh, um, as you know, the uh, laser is, is uh, we'll, we'll, you know, by the end of the course, we will be able to understand the operation uh, uh, of the laser uh, uh, and why it has uh, optics that is, uh, you know, not limited by uh, lenses, etc., but really by uh, laws of diffraction, uh, look at a little bit of Gaussian beams, but most importantly, things like resonators, uh, interaction of light with matter, which is, you know, the laser is built uh, because of very strong coupling between light and matter, uh, and uh, uh, stimulated emission, uh, rate equations, design of lasers, various kinds of lasers, uh, uh, semiconductor lasers, gas lasers, solid state uh, lasers, uh, quantum cascade lasers, uh, free electron lasers. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So there are all kinds of lasers. So we'll look at the various kinds. Uh, but the main, uh, the main goal of this course is to get the uh, basic idea of the laser across. You know, why, why does it make it, uh, what makes it tick? What is the physics behind it? What is the electromagnetic theory? And what is the quantum? In, in this, uh, uh, I mean, what, what, what part of quantum plays and what part electromagnetic theory plays in understanding how a laser works. And we'll, uh, what we'll try to make a connection to in this class is uh, uh, to uh, uh, those who are in, uh, have had courses on uh, electrical circuits, we'll see that it's actually not too different from a very simple LC oscillator. In fact, that's what we're going to start discussing today. Uh, but it's uh, operates at a much higher frequency, not at megahertz or gigahertz, but hundreds of terahertz, you know, so it's a visible wavelength or, or, or you know, and such. So, but the basic, uh, uh, th you know, physics and the basic mechanisms that make it work are exactly the same as the LC oscillator. You know? so, so that's what we're going to start off with today. Uh, uh, I, I think you know that uh, coherent radiation with, from lasers has a lot of applications in nonlinear optics, communication, precise timekeeping, whether you are delving deep into looking at the, some of the shortest time scales that are ever, have been ever measured by human beings, attoseconds, you know, and things like that, to uh, some of the longest distances far out in the galaxy we're using lasers. I mean, they are, they are really helping us probe, uh, uh, you know, things that are uh, extending the, our knowledge in physics itself and knowledge in science itself. So, so that, 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 that's something to keep in mind. At the same time, they're extremely useful, as you know, in, in, in communications. I think every email you send, there is a laser somewhere doing something, right? So, 
uh, uh, nonlinear optics, medical imaging, surgery, uh, all kinds of things. Right? So, I think, so we'll obviously talk about them as we go along. Uh, so one of the things is, uh, towards the end, uh, we, we will have a few demonstrations throughout the class, but towards the end you will actually build, design and build a laser in this course as part of one of the assignments. So that will be hopefully you know, exciting and interesting for you. Uh, you know, you'll do it in the lab. So. It, it, this, is not a, this course doesn't have a lab requirement, but it's a, for one of the assignments you will actually build one. So. So by the end of the course, uh, the outcomes would, you'd be able to analytically design and physically uh, construct a functional laser with simple optics, uh, uh, have an understanding of operating principles of various kinds of lasers, tunable lasers, ultra-fast, high-power fiber and semiconductor lasers, understand how to design uh, uh, and the physics behind continuous wave operation or CW operation mode locking, cue switching, and harmonic generation. These are things we are going to discuss. And uh, uh, okay, so these are all written, and I don't want to go <laughs> over them uh, line by line, but uh, one thing I want to kind of set, uh, you know, make sure that we all are on the same page from the beginning uh, is uh, the thing about homeworks and exams. Uh, homeworks are an integral part. There will be approximately six, maybe seven, but six assignments throughout the semester, uh, one every two weeks roughly. Uh, and you are uh, allowed, maybe even in encouraged, I would say, if you so wish, to work with other students uh, in the class on your homeworks. Uh, but the uh, uh, you know, students you have worked with, uh, you should uh, put their names down when you turn in your own homework. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, what you turn in must be in your own writing and must have your own plots and figures if they are required in the assignment. Uh, but turning in plots or figures or text that are ex exact replicas of somebody else is considered cheating, and that is something you'd really want to avoid. You know, I mean, that's something, even if you work together, you've got to write it up by yourself, make your own plots, and uh, not use somebody, I mean, uh, somebody else's. So that's, that's uh, I want to be clear about that. Uh, um, and I know in spite of the, your best intentions, this sometimes falls through the cracks, so I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page on this. Uh, assignments must be turned in before the uh, before class and the due date and uh, uh, the time when you turn it in should be there'll be a, it, these are you know things I h hate to really spell out in the first class but I have to because I won't have a chance later and it'll be too late then uh, so there'll be about 10 percent penalty each day of delay and after three days uh, we will not accept any more assignments three days after it's due uh, and this solution should be posted and there will be no exceptions to this rule this is how we're going to set it up in the beginning so. And uh, there are some details about how to present things. Uh, please read them. Essentially, just be clean and show all the relevant steps so that the person who's grading is able to give you points and all that. Uh, and uh, we'll have a course grader for this class uh, uh, because of its size. Uh, but we'll obviously, the grader will be working with both the instructors. Uh, I, I, d I don't want to kind of read through the cheating policy, but there's a website. You can go and read through that. Uh, I would like to start by saying that, you know, there is really no escaping the fact that lasers are just very cool objects, and let's not spoil that fun by getting into this mess and just do our job. You know, that's and then uh, we'll do our job and you do yours, right? So that'll be. F uh, so uh, uh, so uh, okay. And exams and grades are uh, written up here. Uh, the weightage for grading uh, a large part in assignments, and then two prelims and a final. It's, I think you're used to this, so we're going to be standard. Yeah. Uh, good question. So I'll actually uh, tell you where exactly to uh, dr drop the assignments, but uh, I have suggested that it's turned in in the classroom here before the, cla uh, before the class starts, you know, on the due date. So that's, that's okay. But in case there are any delays and you want to take advantage of that 10% reduction and such things, you can, I'll let you know where, uh, where to turn it in. There'll be a mailbox for it. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, and, and uh, prelim dates are listed here, uh, and in case you have any issues with those dates, you're traveling, going somewhere to give an undergrad seminar, whatever, let me know uh, beforehand so that we'll take care of that problem. Yep. Are those in class or in class prelims? Uh, say that? No, no, these were in class prelims, in class prelims, yeah. So, uh, we're trying to do our best not to require to come later in the evening or other things because I know it's a big class with quite a few of you are undergraduate students, you have busy schedules, so we'll try to maintain that. Yeah. Okay, so and a few demos will be performed, and, uh, uh, and in one of the assignments, as we mentioned, uh, you will design and build a laser. So. 
Okay, so uh, um, that's, that's uh, I think I've gotten my, the hardest part of this cl today's class out of the way. So any, any further questions before we get going on this subject? And okay, good. So, uh, uh, so I will uh, start by saying that uh, th there is uh, kind of a chapter zero in your book. Please read it. I'm not following it very closely right now, but the spirit of uh, uh, the discussion today uh, would be following what's in that uh, preliminary uh, uh, chapter. And uh, what we want to do today is talk, uh, basically I'll try to give you uh, um, the main idea behind a laser. What is a laser? We'll talk about the details uh, of it. We have the whole semester to talk about every detail of it. Right? But today I'll give you a big picture of what is a laser. Right? And uh, uh, that's the goal. And we will uh, start by, uh, um, before we can answer what is a laser, we have to start by uh, asking the question, what is, a, you know, uh, uh, what does a laser do? So, uh, I mean, uh, I want to start with some dry words, but I'll try to start illustrating them as we go along. Right? So, there's some stuff written here. Let's neglect that for now, uh, and uh, we can start uh, with a discussion. And uh, I know many of you have uh, actually have had some experience with lasers in, in the lab or have seen in fact, most of you have seen lasers, but uh, uh, if you have worked with them, maybe you have a little bit of a deeper insight into what they are. Let me ask this question, you know, maybe we just, uh, for a couple of minutes, discuss a little bit about what your conceptions are about a laser. So, you know, do not read what's written there. Just uh, uh, anybody wants to take a, uh, uh, you know, shot at the answer as to what is a laser, if you want to kind of just say what is the defining feature of a laser. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Is it one fixed wavelength? Point? It's a one fixed wavelength. Very, very good. So it's light of a, uh, of a fixed uh, wavelength. So that's definitely one of the defining features. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. Exactly right. So uh, I think you're filling in the gaps now. So uh, <coughs> you can have light of a fixed wavelength, but it still may not be a laser till you ensure that all of them, all the light is in the same phase, which is the coherence part of it, right? So, uh, so I would also add that same phase. And these things we will obviously develop a very heuristic and intuitive feel as we discuss the rest of today and for the whole semester. What do we mean by all these things? Anything else? Yep. Yeah, the light is highly amplified, like its intensity is way higher than the light that we have. Right, amplified, right? So, uh, so let me see. So this would be something we will see today, which is necessary to achieve these things. So you have to amplify it to achieve these things. Right? But you're right, there is, without amplification, uh, uh, there is no laser. Right? So, so uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something we're going to see as well. These are all in the name as well, right? So, yep. <laughs> Any, anything else? You want? Or you can also, so th I think that kind of roughly captures what a laser is, but uh, there are a few other things which we will talk about. But let me also look at the other end of the spectrum, so to say, <coughs> what can you do with a laser? What can a laser do that nothing else can? You know, no other thing that we know today at least can do. Nonlinear yeah. optics. Nonlinear optics, so th that's a great uh, application. So nonlinear optics is essentially probing matter beyond, you know, um, beyond the linear dielectric co coefficients or the things like that. Yes, and then that that happens because of combination of these things, high intensity and then wavelengths and such things. Yes, and when uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, information. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, communication. So you can uh, uh, have. Uh, Communications, right? Uh, and and that that really is enabled by we are going to see today a uh, very high bandwidth capacity because the frequency is so large, and uh, you can push a lot more data using light than uh, uh, using uh, uh, standard currents in 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 in, in wires and this. It's, and there are issue uh, advantages of loss. I mean, low loss and such things. So absolutely, yeah. Any other things? Yeah. Yep. Medicine for 
purposes like corrective surgery? Yes, yeah, we discussed. So that's right. So, uh, you know, the high inten uh, and controllable intensity and the wavelengths lead to uh, applications in surgery and, and, you know, diagnostics, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the one more thing you can do is generate extremely short, short pulses of light. I and mean, these pulse widths can be down to uh, femtoseconds or maybe even attoseconds. In fact, these are so short that they bothered the discoveries of quantum mechanics like Niels Bohr and John von Neumann uh, so much because they thought it violates the uncertainty principle because it goes way below what was originally thought to be the limits of uncertainty principle. But you know, after, uh, uh, but it's clear now that that, that 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 it doesn't violate uncertainty principle. It's just a new object that was not modeled, understood in the right way in the beginning. So, okay, so that's kind of a rough, uh, uh, um, uh, roughly capturing what uh, uh, we will talk about. But we'll talk about a little bit more detail about these things today. Okay, and let's let's look at. I think you have obviously a fair idea of what. Uh, 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 what lasers do. So the first thing is it's a source of coherent light, right? Coherent light. And uh, let me, uh, uh, today is going to be mostly qualitative, you know, no equation, not much equations. Uh, so it's mostly qualitative discussion on, on what laser does, okay? So uh, uh, let me start with uh, uh, that aspect of it, source of coherent light, right? And, and these points are going to be, going to come back when we discuss it. <laughs> So, uh, <coughs> so co uh, a current light, let's start with the first thing you said, it's a specific wavelength, right? specific wavelength. And I think we know that uh, 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 the uh, wavelength of light and the, uh, 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 the, the, the frequency of light are related uh, by their product, which is the speed of light. Right? So, so that's, that's the... Uh, for light, uh, that's, that's true. Uh, if you're going in vacuum, if you're going in some material media, there's a little refractive index here and all that. Let's not bother about those things at this point. So, uh, uh, so, so and I think we also uh, understand, and we'll look at it again in the review, that uh, light is uh, an oscillation of electric fields and magnetic fields. It's an electromagnetic wave and comes out of Maxwell's equations. And, and uh, let's just look at the aspect of oscillation. So we're saying we have a specific frequency, let's call it lambda naught, specific frequency, uh, specific wavelength. You know, for example, the one that I'm using here, well, that's green, right? A green laser, a wavelength about 532 nanometer, 532 nanometer, so that would be green. And uh, uh, if you do the numbers, the frequency for 532 nanometer will come out to be you know, close to 100 terahertz, about roughly 100 terahertz. So what does that mean? Well, that's 10 to the power 14 hertz. Right? Uh, these are very ballpark estimates. I, I can be off by a factor of two or something like that, but you know, I'm not doing the numbers. So corresponding to those, this will be. So uh, let's just kind of uh, try to make a connection here that uh, uh, if you build a simple electrical circuit, maybe on a chip or on, 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 uh, you know, uh, on breadboards or using discrete elements or sometimes on a, a um, you know, silicon chip, uh, you can make LC oscillators and, and create you know, uh, sine waves with, with a certain frequency. And there, uh, if you're uh, if you're kind of hitting a few uh, tens of gigahertz, you're doing very well already. So so, uh, but this is uh, 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 a factor of uh, so gigahertz is ten to the nine, uh, right? So you are talking about four or five orders higher frequency here. Right? So, so, so so the decimal point, uh, as our text uh, as the author of the textbook says, uh, lasers are essentially just like electrical circuits, but the decimal point has moved five spaces or six spaces to the right, you know, in, in, in terms of frequencies and all that. That's what a laser really is in, in that sense. Okay. So, uh, uh, so this is where this high frequency part of it comes in, and this uh, uh, high frequency part of it also enables a large bandwidth, you know, if you have, uh, and capacity to carry data and such things. But okay, so let's look at uh, uh, what do we mean by coherence. Right? So if you want spectrally pure, meaning just one wavelength, so lambda should be 530 nanometer, and if I were to plot 
uh, and therefore the frequency is also locked. It's, it's, it has one frequency. It's locked because the product is speed of light. So if I were to make a plot of this, you know, in terms of if I have a laser light coming through and I have equipment by which I can scan through frequencies and see where do I have energy coming in at what frequency? How will it look? In the frequency space, this is frequency in hertz or terahertz or whichever. And I'm looking at, you know, maybe I'm calling it the intensity. I think you know that this is going to be the uh, pointing vector, you know, electric field times magnetic field, or, you know, proportional to square of the electric field, right? So, but, you know, those details we'll talk later, but how will it look here in this plot if I were to measure it here? Like when the screen jumped. That's right. It will be very sharp, right? And it will have you know, what we might call a Dirac delta sort of behavior at a frequency F naught, which is whatever is the frequency of light. Right? right? So this, this is how it's going to look. Uh, so this is not current, but let's call it just intensity of, of, of radiation coming. And you measure it. All right. OK, so if that's the situation in the frequency space, I think you uh, by uh, you, you, you probably have a good intuition now. If I were to measure it with time, how should it look? Time, meaning what I'm measuring now is with time. I have an incredible detector by which I can, you know, measure time to the to the depths of time in the shortest time scales, and which is actually not possible. Today. But let's say if you were able to, uh, what will you measure in time? Let's say I'm tracking. I have built a little, uh, you know, equipment which tracks the electric field, right? of this light wave. So how will it look in time? A sinusoid. a sinusoid, right? It's an oscillation, right? And it will be uh, a, a sinusoid, right, which uh, with electric field oscillating like that. But let's just ask uh, this question, you know, uh, how long must I measure or something like, you know, how long should I measure or how long does should the oscillation go on to give you this? Infinity. Infinity. It must be you know, from the beginning of time till the end, right? So it should be all the way. So it's, it has to be a full, you know, infinitely long uh, wave to, for you to get this. Right? Okay. The moment you cut it off, let's say I have, uh, you know, l let me just uh, draw maybe a more wave. So, so let's say I had, you know, a wave running like that, minus infinity plus infinity, I get that. Let's say I kind of cut it off right here and say I have a pulse of laser light, not continuous you know, train. If I cut it off, what happens here? Right. Uh, right, that's exactly right. So, so you won't have this anymore, right? You won't have this anymore. Uh, this this uh, sort of uh, window over which you have uh, emitted that pulse of light uh, appears here as you know broadening and this broadening in frequency delta f uh, let's call it tau here right is 1 over tau roughly right so 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 the shorter you make the pulse the broader it gets right in I think you, you know, the, those of you who have a lot of uh, uh, experience in Fourier, or, you know, series and all, you realize right away that you need light waves of different frequencies, not just this particular frequency, but a little longer, a little shorter, all that stuff says that you make all of them just right and cancel them all out here, if you're do breaking it up into Fourier series, right? And therefore, these are the components that you need to, you know, do that, right? So I think you know that, uh, from here that if I multiply this by 2 pi, the frequency, we get omega. 2 pi times uh, delta f is, let's say, delta omega. Uh, and for any wave, you have this you know, thing that uh, uh, the uh, uncertainty in the frequency, the uncertainty in the time over which you, you can see the wave or you observe the wave is related by this quantity, right? By it's uh, greater than half. And uh, uh, uncertain frequency and times in you know, uncertain time, and that uh, uh, tells you the line width, how broad is the spectrum, how sharp is the spectrum of the laser, and all that. Right. So that's that's why uh, you know that's that's essentially uh, one of the 
uh, important results from any wave, for any wave. This is, you know, not just, it, if you have an electron wave or a matter wave, it's the same deal. You, know. you just multiply by h bar on both sides and you get the uncertainty principle, right? I mean, so, yep. Can you explain that equation again? Yeah, okay. So maybe I, I want to give you a more intuitive feel for it first, right? So let's say I'm, you have built a detector and you observe light and there's nothing coming out and, and your meter goes off and says, oh, I have something coming in. But then you suddenly stop, right? only with a half a wavelength, let's say. The R you see even shorter than that. Right? Then you can't say it's a wave. Right? You can't even say because you don't, it has not even completed a frequency, a whole cycle. So you can't say whether it's a, you know, a rising linear wave, you know, signal or it's actually oscillating, you can't say it. That's what it really means intuitively that you need to have a large number of cycles before you can be certain that it's a certain frequency. You need to measure a large number of cycles right, before you can say that it, this signal has a certain frequency. If you can't, if you, if you, ha if you see a signal only for a short time, and uh, then that signal uh, must have, uh, meaning if it oscillates but only for one cycle, then it has all these frequencies. That's it. So, so th there's uncertainty in the frequency related to how long you measure. So, meaning if you want to conclude from here that wavelength coming in is at that wave. It, it is, or the frequency is such, you, you can only do it with this much precision, depending on how long. Obviously, if you measure till infinity, you can be completely precise. Delta omega would be zero, right? Because you can be absolutely precise. That's kind of the intuitive idea of this. Right? Any questions? Okay, so uh, we are talking about uh, the aspect of coherence now, right? And uh, uh, so, so this is light, and I think you, you kind of uh, realize that we can generate sinusoids and signals with the oscilla LC oscillators, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, I will make that connection now. Right? So, so this is about frequency and time. Uh, now, uh, if, I, uh, um, if I were to ask now f physically what is going on here, how, uh, how is it that I'm generating a coherent wave in a laser, right? So let me uh, just uh, point out, ex you know, roughly again, qualitatively, initially, how one generates a coherent wave with a laser. Right? And we're going to discuss this in a little more detail as well today. But uh, uh, here's pretty much all the quantum we need at this stage till kind of almost the uh, maybe um, month and a half into this course. This is all the quantum mechanics we need to get started on understanding lasers. What quantum mechanics says is all matter, be it atoms, be it a semiconductor, be it titanium atoms inside sapphire, which is the tie sapphire laser, whatever matter you have, if you have matter which has mass, electrons, you know, uh, uh, then uh, quantum mechanics says that uh, these uh, uh, particles can have energies that are uh, discrete. You know, I mean, they have discrete energy levels, right? And, uh, and I think you know that light, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, um, in quantum mechanics, uh, before quantum mechanics came along, light had, uh, it was uh, understood not quite as coherent, but what, what uh, the best knowledge that people had about light was from what's called the black body radiation. I mean, that's, how, that's actually how quantum mechanics itself started. Right? So what does black body radiation do? So you, you, you basically have a box uh, inside which you have maybe all, uh, a, a large number of atoms, you know, uh, a large number of atoms uh, which have uh, electrons which, uh, and, and these atoms are different kinds, so they have different energy levels, so you have uh, various, you know, such energy levels, and, and they have distribution of those energy, other, other kinds of atoms. And then you also have inside it a lot of energy in the form of light. So you have light waves, maybe with a mirror bouncing back and forth and interacting very strongly with these atoms. So you just get a qualitative picture. The details are irre irrelevant at this point. So you have light, you have a, you know, a very dense soup in some sense of light and matter. So they're interacting very strongly with each other. You know? And then you uh, look what comes out of this region. You know? And obviously uh, you, you have made the design such that the atoms do not come out but light comes out. So you are looking at light outside. And you plot outside here as a function of say frequency, as we talked about there, right. what comes out. 
And uh, uh, if, you, if you make a plot of that as a function of intensity, what you'll see is it, it has a behavior, uh, something, something which looks you know, something like that as a function of frequency. And uh, does anybody know what is the expression for this? Yeah. yeah. Or rather, not, not the you know, quantitative version, but you know, what's, it has a name, right? So. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, asymptotic. Uh, right, right. This is asymptotic behavior. Uh, but uh, so this was actually. Let me first ask. I mean, it's uh, who 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 first did this? Uh, explain this. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Gaussian. Gaussian. Yeah. So the shape. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, not. Not. Uh, it's. It's not Gaussian though. I mean, it has a slightly different. Yeah. Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell. Bosman. Sorry. Yeah. No, these are nice names. So actually, it's very, very good you mention it. So Maxwell and Boltzmann explain this part of it. Planck. <laughs> Planck, yeah. So, so, and then there was a Rayleigh-Jeans law who explained that part of it. And uh, you know, Rayleigh-Jeans law had an issue with high energies or high frequencies, Maxwell, low frequencies. And uh, the reason why, uh, so this, was ex this is called the Planck's curve or, you know. Uh, uh, and then this expression is where uh, uh, the Planck's constant first made its appearance, H, H or H bar. That's H, H bar. That's where the first made its appearance. And uh, this expression actually has, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are frequencies uh, in the numerator. I think there's probably a third power. Uh, don't quote me on that. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I think that's what you are getting towards, right? So, and here you have a kT minus 1. So, so this, is, this is the distribution of the intensity as a function of frequency. And this is called the black body radiation. So, so this is the black body radiation. This, is, this curve is the birth of quantum mechanics, you know, which, which uh, says what he had to assume is these atoms or matter can exchange energy with light, not in a continuous fashion, but only in discrete packets. Only in discrete packets. It can take. For example, if I have a an atom with two energy levels like this, could be a hydrogen atom, you know, with <laughs> this is minus 13.6 eV below the vacuum, this is, you know, that by four. So it can only do, take in photons at this energy and not anything else. You know, so. And not only that, it can take in, you know, one, or if I have, you know, it can take in discrete packets of that energy, it cannot take in a very large number, yeah. Uh, does black body radiation make any sort of assumption as to what type of elements are present? Ah, good point. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's a very good point. In fact, it does. You know, it, 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 you must have a large range of uh, atoms with the various energies uh, or gases. You know, that's what typically is in the in, the, in these ovens uh, uh, that uh, give you a large enough spread in these energy spectra so that you get this this sort of behavior. And we'll see that. I mean, that, why, the way I'm trying to motivate this is if I change this the changes I have to make here to make it into a laser. Now this, as you see, is the furthest from a laser. This is completely incoherent light, right? It has no wavelength sp spectral purity. It is, it's not, doesn't have a single frequency. It's spread out, right? And it has uh, uh, also no uh, 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 phase purity, which I'll actually talk about now. But that's the black body radiation. And what I want to also say here is uh, this, uh, you know, the birth of quantum mechanics also led to a few things. These are things you must remember. I mean, I don't require you to memorize many things, but if you don't know these, you obviously should. This is, these are things you should just, you know, be in your head all the time. So uh, energy is h, uh, h bar times omega, which is omega is the circular frequency, which is 2 pi times the frequency, right? Uh, and, and the frequency here is the one that goes into, you know, th this relationship. So speed of light and frequency are related to that. I think I've written nu here, but, uh, you know, f or nu, I think book probably uses nu, so I use nu here. Okay. The energy uh, uh, of, a fo of, of a, uh, you know, oscillat oscillating wave, which we will call later as a photon once we, you know, absorb all the quantum. Uh, the energy of a photon, uh, if you know its wavelength in nanometers, is 1240 by this. So, so this meaning, if I have a photon, or if I have electromagnetic radiation whose wavelength is 1240 nanometers, or 1.24 microns, right? 
then its energy is one electron volt. You know, that's that's the uh, way to remember that. And these are very simple things, but very important to remember and have a feel for. Or in other words, if I have an atom which has energy level separated by one electron volt, this could be, for example, a semiconductor indium gallium arsenide sort of semiconductor where you have two bands with lowest energy and and highest energy here separated by one electron volt. Then the you know photon that it will absorb is. Uh, will have uh, a wavelength of 1.24 micron. So, so that's, that's what it means, and these are interchangeable, right? So this is the light and matter interaction. And the separation here is h, h uh, times uh, nu or h bar omega. So, and so now what we're going to see is uh, uh, what do you do to twist this light matter interaction where light comes in, it kicks an electron out from here to there and excites the atom. And then, uh, uh, obviously, that uh, as you know, this will be a non-equilibrium situation. It won't stay there for too long. It's going to decay, and it's going to emit another photon. Right? So it absorbs and it emits. It absorbs and uh, matter absorbs and emits radiation, right? And if you leave it to its own design, if you leave it to do whatever it wants, you're going to get this right? black body radiation. Right? If you do a little more work, you take a semiconductor and you or make a light bulb, you know, where you actually kind of doing black body radiation again, but on a much smaller scale. You are heating up a tungsten wire, and you, you know, essentially uh, end up with a, a, a light, uh, which is, let me just draw it with frequency, uh, or with wavelength, let's say you have violet here, let's say 400 nanometer is violet, and red would be, let's call it 700 nanometer, or 750 or so. So if you look at the spectral purity of a light coming out of a uh, incandescent light bulb, you know, you'll, you'll get something like that. And the bandwidth of it in frequency, remember lambda and f are related, is roughly 10 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz, depends, you know, something like that. If you measure the spectral line width of, of uh, well, what are the wavelengths uh, that are being uh, emitted by the light bulb, you'll see there's a spread of that and so this, this range. Right? Now, in a laser, this frequency is you know, the line width here would be, uh, you can push it down to megahertz or much lower than that, meaning, meaning uh, definitely megahertz, that's not difficult, but even much lower than that. It's much, much sharper in frequency. So for a yellow laser, for example, let's say, you know, which is the middle, or, or you know, the light bulb looks roughly yellow to the eye, so, so that's uh, the wavelength, right? So uh, how does one do that, right? I mean, and, and that's, that's the first thing we want to kind of start uh, asking. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, in a, a laser, you can actually generate light of very large range of uh, uh, energies. That's very important. So, so in, a, in a low power semiconductor laser, typically we are generating 10 to the power minus 3 watts or in milliwatts. So uh, you can actually go in semiconductor lasers up to um, kilowatts, uh, if you combine power correctly, do good heat dissipation, you can get up to 10 to the power 3 watts. Uh, uh, so that would be a kilowatt. And this is typically what semiconductor or solid, you know, uh, uh, diode laser, semiconductor based diode lasers uh, do. But uh, uh, with gas lasers and uh, bigger size lasers, you can go way beyond, much beyond than that. You know, you can go uh, actually gigawatts. Uh, is possible, and I think that's where you get into, you know, an exawatt, terawatt, also possible. You know. uh, that's where you get into the the Death Star range and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's possible, and uh, uh, I think that those are the ones that are used a lot in industry today for laser welding and cutting, you know, st cutting through steel and all that. That's what it's, yeah. That's what we're building for the final project. Right? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else would be a disappointment here, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can get started. We have gotten started. <laughs> yeah, no. no, yeah, sure. No, we'll be, uh, I think we'll be somewhere here. Uh, that's what Cliff has promised, that we are not going to burn a hole through Phillips Hall because it's already kind of teetering a little bit. So, yeah. <laughs> so, we'll be over there. Right? So, just an example, the first laser, uh, solid-state laser that was ever made, solid-state laser was uh, by Ted Maiman. Uh, uh, it was a ruby laser, uh, emitted at around 690 nanometer, roughly red. And it, it was uh, 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 emitting kilowatts, you know. So, so the first laser already was doing kilowatts. So it's you know not uh, uh. so okay. So there's a very wide range. 
Uh, typically, the lower uh, energies, uh, at the lower energy scales, the lower powers, you can operate it in what's called continuous wave, where you let it run for good. Uh, but for very high, uh, you, you do pulsed, you know, uh, pulsed operation where you essentially let out a very large pulse of energy, you know, very high energy, but a short pulse, and then repeat, repeat, the pulse lasers. Okay, so uh, I think I uh, did take a little more time than what I uh, initially uh, decided, but uh, uh, let me just, uh, just start with the very, you know, uh, in, uh, heuristic intuitions of what leads to this broadening. What leads to this broadening when light starts interacting strongly with matter, and how do you fight it? How do you make it spectrally one wavelength? And that's not just enough, as you mentioned, the wavelength, but then also the phase. And the phase also must be all of, you know, every atom that's going to be emitting your light there, you know, a photon, every atom should get in line. So all of them should be in phase. They should be all be rotating at the same, it's a couple oscillator system, you know, so they all oscillate at the same time. So, so we want to see how you get to do that, those two things. How do you get to those two things to work in any laser? In any laser, these two things must happen. You must have spectral uh, wavelength or frequency, one frequency and one phase. So that's, that's the definition of coherence for this. Uh, and and, and, and uh, 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 so, so I think you, uh, again, I'll just write another equation in the last couple of minutes here. But I think you know that uh, uh, if I were to write the uh, electric field uh, as a function of time and space in an electromagnetic wave which represents the classical notion of light, then typically it would be uh, you know, some amplitude times a direction. Let's say your uh, electric field is oscillating around the x-axis. So, uh, but then you have this you know, k dot r minus omega t, right? That's how an electric field looks for, for any electromagnetic wave. So you have a certain amplitude in volts per meter, or volts per centimeter, a certain direction. And then here's the phase. This is, this is the total phase. The k is 2 pi over the wavelength, right? the wave vector. And that wavelength and is related here right? so the fr to the frequency here. Sorry, and, and, and here's the frequency, right? 2 pi times f. Right? So what happens is when atoms start you know, interacting, you say pump it with a very large amount of light source. You take uh, you know, atoms in a box. And you have m maybe a, a, a source of light here, uh, maybe a you know, very intense light bulb or something that's emitting a lot of photons you know, that you're electrically pumping from outside. And then these light are, uh, for this, the, the light is interacting strongly with atoms. It will excite atoms. Let's say, first things first, we typically want the same kind of atom. So what kind of atom do you have? Does it make a difference? Yes, it does in a big way. Because if you have all the atoms are the same, let's say, then clearly all these energies are going to be the same. Right? If it's a gas, right? So all these energies are the same. Or if you have a distribution, then you'll have a distribution of energies as well. So, uh, so that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to build the kind of simplest laser. All the atoms are the same. Let's say, uh, um, um, well, hydrogen. I mean, that's uh, or we use helium. Typically, a helium neon laser is a uh, red laser, any laser, a helium cat, and other things. So uh, we'll have all the atoms the same. In the in that case, we can be ensured at least to start with that I'll get a very sharp spectra here. Right? I'll get a sharp spectra here. I can be sure about that. If I have many, then I'll get you know this 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 and all this, and they will kind of overlap, and then you get this thing. So that, that's one. But the most important thing about the laser now is uh, something I'll end with today and we start in the next class, is also the phase. I mean, the, the, the getting the uh, right wavelength is not very difficult. There's a little more difficult is to get the same phase, but all of them kind of go at the same time. And the reason for that is once an electron abs uh, absorbs a photon or light, it goes up and the atom gets excited. Right? But then it waits for a certain amount of time before it starts radiating. It waits for a certain amount of time before it starts radiating. So let's say I have, you know, let's say I have two atoms or three atoms, and one starts radiating. Uh, uh, so so uh, there are two things that happen. There's, uh, there's, there's going to be loss of light in some sense. The loss is whatever gets out of the wave or it gets, you know, part of it, there's a skin depth, heat and all that. Some of the energy gets absorbed. 
Because of loss, you'll have a decay in the amplitude. The frequency will remain the same because the frequency is energy, separation of energy, but the amplitude is going to decrease because of losses. Exactly the same as the LC oscillator. You add a little resistance, you know, instead of oscillating, it starts decaying. Right? Same deal. The second thing is there are many atoms, and not all of them start radiating at the same time. One of them may wait a little bit and start a little later. And something start a little later. That's phase. That's the phase. So now you have, uh, you know, a decaying, uh, uh, so a, a, a decaying wave like that, another decaying wave, but it started there. Exactly the same replica of that. Another that started from there. And when you add all of these electric fields, you get something like that. So the phase is flipping. It started and suddenly it flips. And suddenly it flips. So these two things are going to determine if you can control the wavelength and the phase, make all the atoms go at the same time, right? That's how you get the laser. So that's, that's the rough idea of how the laser works. And unfortunately, just as we get, in, get into this, we are out of time today. But I'm actually going to stop here. And uh, because this is a good point, we'll start from here and show you a full working. You know, yeah, we have a quick question. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, when we have a laser, I couldn't hear you. We have. Oh, yeah. No, in a, in a laser, what we are going to do, we'll see, is first we'll straighten this out. It will not decay, right? The second, we'll ensure that it's not going to flip phases and it's going to go on forever. Inside. We'll do that in the next class on Friday. Thank you.